Welcome to Accelerate My Practice. So glad you could join me here today. Today I want to talk about the impact of dental insurance on your practice. And the reason why I want to talk about it is I've been hearing a lot of stories about patients who can't afford, insurance doesn't cover it, and it's something that we all know about. And if you've been with us for a while, you've heard this topic before, I would assume, but it's always good to revisit it because sometimes we fall back into old habits. So the issue comes up of, hey, how do we handle this? Yeah, you know, it's the time of year where maybe we already maxed out the patient's insurance for the year. Should we just wait and do the, the remaining procedures in January? You know, because it's only like three months away, or should we do them now and it's out of pocket? We have all these questions that come up in our heads. And oftentimes what happens is we start thinking ourselves about it. And you're like, you know, I, I, if I were that person, I think I'd wait. And, and maybe not do it, and, and therefore we project our values onto these people. And it's a challenging space, and it's one that's interesting right now because in many cases we're trying to use up insurance benefits. So in some ways we're kind of talking out of both sides of our mouths of, hey, use your insurance, but you know don't make decisions based on insurance. And, and I'll fully admit and own that, that there's a bit of a interesting uh, dynamics going on there relative to this topic. It is totally true. And you know what? If you paid for the benefit, you might as well use it. No doubt about that. And I think it's fair to say that. And, and I'm pretty sure most everyone's been notified, hey, we should be sending these letters out. We really should have probably sent them last month. But if you haven't sent out your end of year uh, benefit letters, I get those out like right now, today. And, and it'll hopefully fill your schedule up. And, and I would use very careful wording like don't waste the money you've already paid. So make sure there's very, very inflammatory wording there. But it still comes back to this question of, hey, what do we do? You know, we've got some treatment. We see some treatment. Do we wait and put it off because of insurance or, and, and risk something going sideways? And, you know, I've had that debate lots of times with doctors where they look at me and they say, Darren, I've... You know, I, I hear the story of we can procrastinate and maybe you get the vertical fracture and lose the tooth. And I've seen one in my entire career. And, and no doubt, can't, can't deny, I have no idea what the statistics are relative to that probability or that outcome taking place. Could be very rare, I, I don't know. And it could be circumstantial. And you know, it really sucks for that one person who did lose it. And all the other ones, I'm glad they were lucky and they won the lottery. But for that one person who did have that, that's a real bummer. So, you know, I kind of have the philosophy and attitude of if we're going to diagnose and write up a treatment plan, it needs to be something that has urgency that needs to be done. Now, if there's something where you see a, a tooth that's got an amalgam in it, the amalgam looks beautiful, you think it's going to last another 10, 15, 20 years, I wouldn't bother treatment planning it unless there's a cosmetic reason behind it and the patient wants to understand what their options are relative to cosmetics versus clinical need. And I think it's important to have that conversation. I was chatting with a doctor recently about this very topic, and, and this came up, and, and there was a circumstance just like that where this patient legitimately did not need to do something, in, in his opinion, at all. It was going to last 10, 15, 20 years. No problem. And the question I came back with was, hey, did you offer a solution for cosmetic reasons? And he's like, you know, I, I didn't. I said, no big deal. I mean, obviously, we can come back and revisit later. But that, that would be the only additional thing I'd offer, especially if it's in an area where it's visible based on how the person smiles or laughs or speaks. You know, again, if they don't smile, laugh, or speak, or it's on a, you know, fa not a facial, uh, lingual, and you can't really see it, or it's on a buckle and you can't really see it, it's in a posterior molar, you know, I don't know if I'd be too worried about it either. So I'm not suggesting we, we get in the business of removing every single amalgam just for giggles, although I do have clients who are listening to this that say, you know, that's their entire practice. Not judging. I don't know what's right or wrong. That's for you guys to decide. I just know that we should all, always offer our patients the best. And one of the challenges I seem to face all the time is this, you know, let's watch it sort of content, especially with newer offices that we just begin with. And, and, you know, there are appropriate times to monitor things, to see how they are going, to see if they're improving. And then there's times where we should just fix it. And, you know, at least in my experience, restorative issues are things that we should just generally fix. But, again, I'll defer that back to you guys. And, and you know, the, the argument I always get back from people is that the patients can't afford it. And, you know, I want to reference the uh, surgical procedures that are done in this country. And, and again, if you've been through the program recently, you've seen these slides. But I think, again, it's always great to revisit it. 
Look how many Botox procedures are being done per year. And granted, this data, they only put this data out every uh, year, 18 months. So it, it, there's lag behind it. This is 2013, if I recall. There's 6.3 million Botox procedures at an average of $380 a procedure for a grand total of $2.4 billion per year. B, billion, 2.4 billion. And then we start looking at surgical procedures. And you look at uh, breast augmentation as an example, $3,600 a crack, and it's a $1.6 billion business per year. Again, $1.6 billion with a B. You look at uh, uh, nose, rhino, uh, rhinoplasty, uh, nose reshaping, for those of us who can't speak big words, $4,500 a procedure for $1.4 billion. You add up all those surgical procedures, you're again up in the $10, $15 billion a year. So you add up the minim minimally invasive procedures, the surgical procedures, you're in the $20 to $30 billion a year, and then you're afraid of telling a patient they need a crown and we should wait for insurance benefits because we, you know, they're maxed out. The question is, are you making dentistry something they want or are you make it, making it something that scares them to death? And if we can make it something that they desire, that there's a positive outcome for, that they can be excited about, I think what you'll see is your acceptance rate increase. And I think you'll see them do it faster, which is a good thing for them. I'd rather treat MODs than root canals and crowns. I mean, I know economically it's better if I do it the other way, but for the patient's sake, I'd rather just treat MODs. So that being said, I want to sign off for the day. Don't procrastinate. Go tell your loved ones you love them. Go tell your patients they should get their treatment done today. And, you know, give the TV a high five because I'm here for you and I love y'all. Say hi to your coaches for me as you see them. If you have questions, get in touch with them and see what they can do to help you. Other than that, we'll see you next week, 8 o'clock Mountain, 10 o'clock on the East Coast. Until then, have a great day. What if you could have the practice of your dreams? What's holding you back? Imagine a life where you have everything you ever wanted.